Okay, so welcome to this chapter in which we will discuss the current groups. And um, we start with the construction which is due to Bobaki, which will allow us to extend the smooth structure around the identity of a group to a Lie group structure on the whole group. Okay, and before we start, let's recall a little bit the multiplicative notation for sets, which we'll be using in the next proof. So if we have two sets in a group, say A and B, uh, the set A times B is uh, the set of all elements which can be written as products of elements of A and B in that order. Uh, since we are not requiring that the group multiplication is commutative, we have to insist on the order. Usually this will not make any difference for us because the sets we want to multiply with each other will always be the set themselves again. So we're taking basically powers of sets. Okay, and uh, similarly to the multiplicative notation, we also have the inverse. So A inverse is a set of all inverses of elements in A. And uh, set is called symmetric if it coincides with the set of, its, uh, of all of its inverse. Okay, right. So now we're coming to this proposition uh, due to Bobaki. Um, where in Bobaki this is proved for Barnack Lie groups, but it doesn't matter. So actually the proof goes through uh, not only in the Barnack setting, but also in our generalized setting. So the setting is as follows. G is a group and we have two sets U and V, such that V is a neighborhood of the identity, uh, which is symmetric. And the product of V with itself is contained in U. And we assume that U has a smooth manifold structure such that V is open in U. And if we restrict the structural mapping, so the inversion and the multiplication map to V, then we obtain smooth mappings, right? So, and what we can think of, we have, I mean, we have the global structure of the group, but locally around the identity of the group, we know that our uh, group operations, when we, uh, once we restrict them to this, they turn out to be smooth. And um, the smoothness assumption is um, basically what we want to um, transport now to the whole group. And this, for the first statement here is that there is a unique manifold structure on the subgroup generated by this open, uh, or by this neighborhood V. Um, so G naught, we set all the, Elements which we can be which can be reached by uh, iterated products of elements in V. So, and the statement is that G naught becomes a sub uh, becomes a Lie group such that V is open in G naught, and uh, both the manifold structure of G naught and the manifold structure on U induce the same manifold structure on V. Right, and uh, so before we prove that or set out for some proof, let's have a look at the second part of the statement. I mean, obviously we do not only want to turn G naught into a Lie group or in general, we would like a Lie group structure on all of G. And there's a, there's a second statement here, which has an additional assumption. So in a, uh, for all elements in a generating set of the group G, we need that there is a small neighborhood which may depend on the element in the generating set such that conjugation to, uh, takes this small neighborhood um, back into the neighborhood U uh, or into the set U, which is manifold. And the restricted or this conjugation map CG um, on uh, the set WG with values in U is a smooth mapping. And the statement is if we have this additional assumption that uh, the conjugation operation is smooth in some neighborhood of the identity, then um, we obtain a unique manifold structure on, on the whole group, turning it into a Lie group such that, uh, again, the set uh, V is open in G. And now the uh, whole group G and U, they induce the same manifold structure on V. Okay. However, before we are turning to that, we need to prove first this first statement uh, that there is a unique uh, manifolds are turning everything which is generated by V into um, uh, a Lie group. Okay, let's let's prove this. Let's see. Okay. Now, uh, so here we are, we have basically the same setting as before. G is a group. U is the manifold, and we have this nice subset V on which um, 
uh, we know already that our group operations are smooth. So let's see how the proof goes. Actually, we are preparing the whole thing before we are even proving uh, statement one or and or two. So we will construct a manifold structure on all of G. And this will be the unique manifold structure from uh, from the second part of the statement. Um, however, let's let's see how we can prove this. So actually, we need several preparatory steps, or perhaps not even steps, but uh, it's convenient to label these things as uh, steps because then we know where to refer to for the facts we uh, we need. So let's assume we have an open subset A sitting inside of V and a V naught, which is in V. And uh, let's assume we have the, uh, we know for some reason that V naught times A is again an element of, uh, is con again contained in V. Then um, V naught of A is an open subset of uh, V as it is the pre image under the smooth map delta v naught v to u and g is sent to v naught inverse times g. Okay, so I'm refraining here from using um, uh, this in, uh, the inversion uh, map, something uh, something like that. So we have this new mapping delta, and delta is supposed to uh, uh, to remind you of some sort of division, if you want, right? So we are the v naught inverse times g is this in, in Fractional notation would be something like G divided by V naught if you want, but okay, I mean, we don't have fractions here. So however, the delta is will always be uh, some sort of, we are multiplying an element with the inverse of another element. Okay, so this is a, just a small observation. And now um, in the second step I want to take comes um, the crucial uh, part. So we pick an open subset W which sits, sits inside of V with uh, the following properties. So first of all, we want that W is symmetric. Then uh, we want that W cubed, and by the, we de this is by definition as W times W times W, this should be contained in U. Uh, and finally, we assume that there exists a manifold chart phi W. Uh, so this is a manifold chart for the manifold structure on U. Uh, let now G be an arbitrary element in G. Uh, then, we define something which will turn out to be a chart around G. Um, we take this, or we define a mapping phi G, which goes from the shifted set G times W, takes values in phi of W, and it sends an H2, where we pull back the H with G inverse, and then we are inside of W, and where we can uh, apply phi. And uh, the idea is now, we shall see, that um, A, so the set of all these phi and G, this uh, is an atlas of G turning it into a smooth manifold. Okay, I mean, obviously we know already that by construction, the uh, these elements in uh, A cover G. However, we need to see that uh, the change of charts are smooth and that we get an, get a an manifold topology on G. So far, G is just an abstract group. So there's neither a topology nor any kind of other structure there. We only have the group multiplication. And uh, so step three 
uh, G becomes a manifold. Right, so let's see. Let's first consider the case when we have um, that the intersection between two of these, uh, well, what I claim are chart domains, is non empty. Um, or in other words, we have that G1 times H is the same as G2 times H, let's say tilde. What's the upshot of this? And we can just multiply this from the left, G1, uh, G2 inverse times G1. This is then the same as um, H tilde times H inverse. And since the H, um, so this is an element in W, and this is an element in W, and this is in W squared, and uh, also, well, just to recall, this is the contained in V. All right, so what we see step one implies that if we, well, step one is we can multiply W with uh, from the left with this element and we are still staying in uh, we are still staying in v right so this is an element in w squared and we have said that w cubed should be in v um, so this is in in v and um, well so step one shows us that the letter set is open and we intersect w with this uh, set g2 inverse times g1 times w. Okay, so this is an open set not only in v but uh, in fact also in w just by construction. Um, and let's now define d uh, g2 g1 so as phi G2, G1, W intersect with G2, W. And by definition, I mean, how have we, how did we set this up? This is just phi of G2 multiplied with G1, W intersect with G2, W. Uh, sorry, here I was missing an inverse. Right, so we see that this is in fact phi of uh, G2 inverse G1 W intersected with W. Okay, and um, so by construction, since the phi is a chart, um, so this set is open in the model space of phi. So it makes sense to discuss the change of charts on this open subset and we want to see that it's actually a smooth mapping on uh, this open subset. How do we do this? Well, okay, and just plug in something which comes from G2, G1 and then we look at G, um, one, uh, sorry, G2 inverse compose it with f phi g1 of this d then by definition what we get we get phi inverse of d we have to shift this using g2 we have to shift it using g1 inverse and uh, then we have to apply the phi again right okay and um, so this thing here is in W. Um, by construction, we know from the above that this is in W squared. So we have a product of two things. Um, 
something uh, which depends smoothly on D and gets mapped to W and then something from W square. So since all of this is contained in V, or actually in V times V, so we can exploit now that the multiplication map on V is smooth. And we see that this is smooth as multiplication is smooth on smooth on um, yeah smooth on v times v with values in u okay so we actually see that the change of charts are smooth um, which is very nice and uh, obviously we can invert these change of charts by just composing in the different uh, in, in a different order and um, so what we do now, we endow G with the final topology. With respect to the family of mappings given by our shifted charts. Right, and uh, so this topology turns out to be Hausdorff. Remember, in this lecture, all topological spaces are Hausdorff. So the W, um, as uh, being an open set of a Hausdorff space, is the Hausdorff. Um, and actually, one can reduce now the proof that uh, the topology or the final topology is Hausdorff. One can reduce this to the Hausdorff property of W. We call, I mean, the idea is either we can change, uh, we can distinguish between two different elements in in two different chart domains, which are open uh, with respect to the uh, to the final topology here. If it's not possible to distinguish in two chart domains, we uh, can get it into one chart domain. Then we're transporting it back by the multiplication uh, to uh, W, and we distinguish in W. And why is that possible? Well, observe if we have some element G naught in G. Uh, we have the following. So if we compose a chart G, G naught with lambda G naught, again, what was lambda G naught? This is just the left multiplication with, uh, with G naught. So what we get here, if we are just going through the Definition. Oh, sorry, I should to make sense sense of this. We need to restrict here to G times W. So what happens if we do this? We just get the uh, chart phi G. So this shows that uh, that left shifts with fixed elements is continuous. Right, because we have the final topology here, we could just test in that way. And um, not only continuous, but uh, even smooth. Right, because the canonical charts conjugate this one to uh, the identity. And okay, so left multiplication is smooth. And this will be very important for, for us later because uh, we want to establish smoothness later of the group operations with respect to this manifold structure. And uh, our, the leverage we have on the, on the smoothness of the group structure will be that all of the left multiplications are automatically smooth. For the right multiplications, we don't know this yet, uh, but left multiplication is now always smooth with respect to the manifold structure just by construction. And we can, and this is also useful information to deduce that the topology is Hausdorff. Okay, anyway, let's uh, conclude our preliminary work in the fourth step. Um, so the manifold structure induced by our atlas A coincides with the one coming from 
the inclusion into the manifold U. Okay. Um, right, so let's see how this goes. Uh, since uh, the group operations are smooth. On V are smooth by our assumption. There exists um, set containing the identity, and let's call the set again A. This is open in W such that V naught times A is contained in V for. Uh, Ah, sorry, I should, have, I should have set this up a different way. So just to make it clear, so the A here will depend on the V naught. Uh, so and for every V naught in V, we can choose such an open set, which get ma gets mapped by the left shift into uh, uh, into V. Okay. Uh, now step three shows that. Uh, V naught times A is open in uh, G due to the fact that um, <coughs> left shifts are uh, smooth. Right, and we know that uh, if the uh, by construction, because the A V naught is an open subset of uh, W, we have uh, we have on W the chart uh, or W is a chart domain. So um, this actually uh, the construction of the atlas actually shows that if something is open in W, then it will also be open in the manifold topology. Okay. Um, Right. Uh, another thing we should note, if we go from A to V naught, uh, sorry, should carry the index now. Um, so the left multiplication with V naught uh, is a diffeomorphism with respect to the Uh, well, to both manifold structures, right? So for the manifold structure uh, induced by the Atlas A, we just saw this in step three, and uh, that it's a diffeomorphism with respect to the uh, manifold structure in U. This is basically step one, and our assumption on uh, the smoothness of the of the multiplication on V. Okay. Um, and what we deduce is that uh, the manifold structures on V coincide, right? Because we have seen, I mean, on W, that was not a question. We already knew that, but we can shift around W with these diffeomorphisms and see that around uh, any V naught, uh, there, uh, the two manifold structures coincide because they are diffeomorphic. Okay, and um, so this is uh, this is already everything we we wanted. So um, basically, this will also be at the heart of why later on we have a uniqueness statement. I mean, when uh, so it was stated that the manifold structure is unique, which turns the whole group G into a Lie group. And if we have, if we had another Lie group, stru uh, Lie group structure on G, uh, which induces the same manifold structure on V, uh, then we see also that these are diffeomorphic around the identity or around the unit. And uh, therefore, since if two Lie groups are um, diffeomorphic at the unit, by a group diffeomorphism, uh, by a group morphism, then they are already diffeomorphic as 
global objects, so as global groups. Okay, however, so we have constructed now the topology, we have constructed the manifold structure, we know that left translations are smooth and this is essential for us. So let us now, um, let us now prove um, the claims in the proposition. Okay, we want to prove the first claim. Let's quickly recall what was the first claim. So the claim is there's a unique manifold structure on the subgroup G0. G0 is all what can be generated by uh, finite products of elements in V, such that G0 becomes a Lie group and V is open in G0 and both G0 and U and use the same manifold structure on V. Okay, let's see how we do this. Um, so the G0 is uh, everything which can be generated by the V, or in other words, we can say this is the union over all of these uh, sets VK, where we take the power of V with itself. So note that since the, union, uh, the unit is contained in V, this is actually an ascending union of, um, uh, of subsets. So VK will always be contained in VK plus one. Right. Um, however, we can write V2 as uh, all the G in V times uh, G multiplied with V. And so since left multiplication is uh, continuous and smooth, uh, we see that this is actually open in G with respect to the new manifold structure we have here. And inductively, by a trivial induction, we get um, that VK for every K is open in G. Um, um, and this means that the G naught is an open subset in G and thus also a submanifold because as an open subset, it inherits a manifold structure. And by step four in the previous one, um, We already know that uh, U and G naught induce the same manifold structure. On V. Okay. Right. Mm. Thus, uh, we can consider the mapping delta from V times V, now taking values in G naught. And uh, what this mapping should be doing, so it sends GH to G, and then from the right-hand side, and multiplied with H inverse. And since V is symmetric, um, we see that the mapping, um, so we already know that the group operations on V times V are smooth, right? And smoothness of the group operations is equivalent to the smoothness of the mapping delta. Uh, so this is smooth. Um, in, fact, in fact, this is equivalent to the smoothness. of the group operations. On V. Okay, and the idea is now, we want to prove that Delta is smooth on G naught times G naught values in G naught then we see that G naught is a Lie group. So this will be the goal. So instead of looking at the group multiplication and the inversion uh, in 
separate from each other, we shall show that this map delta is smooth. And before we do this, let's take a look. So I said earlier that we want to exploit that left shifts are smooth. So let's um, rewrite this mapping, uh, which sends us to GH inverse. Obviously, this is much too, uh, uh, too simple, this mapping. So let's write it more complicated. Um, so let's write this mapping as H naught, uh, G naught inverse times H naught times G naught inverse G, H naught inverse. Then we are erasing here the inverse and set an inverse outside. And then we write an H naught inverse here. So let's, uh, okay. Obvious, we do this for uh, G naught, H naught, G and H in G, right? So we have this formula. Okay, let's see that uh, this actually is the same as we expect. Um, oh, sorry, and I was missing an inverse upstairs here. Let's see. So what this gives us is G naught, H naught inverse, then we get an H naught. So these two contributions cancel. We have here a G naught inverse. This cancels with this one in front. So we just have the G left. And here we need to take the inverse. So this is H inverse, H naught inverse, inverse is at H naught times H naught inverse. So this gets goes also away. Okay, the reason why we wanted to rewrite this in the much more complicated manner is because we now have the, the following situation. So we can now write this as uh, left shift with G naught H naught inverse um, composed with, and here we have the conjugation action with respect to the H naught. So this is conjugation with H naught. And then we compose with the mapping delta and uh, have here left shift with G naught inverse of the G, left shift with the H naught inverse of the H, right? And let's give this, uh, this formula here the name star. Okay. Um, and so the, the reason why we want to rewrite this, I mean, we want to prove smoothness of delta. However, we see from the formula that delta can be written as, um, well, a bunch of left multiplications, one conjugation action, and then another delta. Okay, and uh, let us now prove um, uh, by induction that delta is smooth on the set VK times V. Okay, um, so let's look at the case K is equal to one. Well, uh, we know that delta is smooth. Great, so we're done with that. But we uh, there's one additional piece of information. We have that uh, we have this mapping here, C H naught. Um, so let's let's assume. Okay, so from V to G naught. Um, okay, and we want to see that this is. Uh, smooth for H naught in V. And how do we do this? Let's consider this CH naught from G and let's also rewrite it. It turns out well, by I mean, first of all, by definition, this mapping is H naught G H naught inverse. Well, we just see that it's a left shift with H naught composed with delta of G H naught. Right, so and if the G, uh, okay, let's let's call this formula double star. So and what we see here, um, 
we get that um, the uh, the uh, we get that the delta uh, is smooth on v times v, right? And left shifts are, are smooth anyway. So we see that um, the conjugation mapping, if the uh, the argument by which we conjugate is just from v, gives us a smooth mapping on v. And um, so induction step from uh, k to k plus one. So uh, we assume that we already know that delta on vk times v with values in g naught is smooth. And ch naught from v k to g naught is smooth for all h naught in v. Right, so and let's let's see how the induction step works. Um, so let g be in v k plus one, h be in v, and set or let's let's pick uh, g naught in uh, v such that if we multiply g naught inverse with g, we are again in vk, right? By the construction of the vk plus one, we can always assume that we are, uh, that we are in this situation. Okay, um, right. And if we want, um, we can take now the h naught in V, oh, sorry, mm. actually, um, we really don't need to take an H naught here if we want. Uh, however, it will be it will be advantages to say let's take H naught equal to H. Okay, and then uh, we look at the formula star. So by star, we just see that delta G and H is left multiplication with something we actually don't care about because all left multiplications are smooth. Then we have C H naught and we compose it with delta of uh, G naught inverse times G, H naught inverse times H. Okay. Before we before we look closer, uh, let's let's uh, let's have a closer look at this. So this guy is by construction in V K. Well, and here we get the identity. However, um, let's perhaps switch the notation a little bit because the point will be if we apply this delta. I mean, we want smoothness of delta, so it's not enough to just look at this in one single point, but we want it in a small neighborhood of G and H. However, uh, by uh, the smoothness of the left multiplication, we may assume that uh, the formula where we have multiplied with G naught inverse, I mean, a priori, we only know that G naught inverse times G is in VK. Okay, however, since the group operation, or the left, sorry, the left shift is smooth, we may assume that this holds for everything in a small neighborhood of um, uh, of G. Similarly, the H naught inverse times Y will be contained in V for all, everything which lives in a small neighborhood. All right? Okay. So uh, what we what we have here now is uh, the smoothness of uh, uh, so uh, we want to compute the smoothness of the of the uh, of the delta on 
something which lives in a neighborhood. And so let me write sloppy VK plus one times V, right? And this, we have to do, we've reduced this to the smoothness of um, something in uh, VK times V, uh, so of, of delta on VK, VK times V. So we know that this part is smooth. You know that this part is smooth. What's missing still, I mean, unfortunately, this guy here, if I take the delta of something in VK and something in V, it turns out that this is contained in VK plus one. So we need also already the smoothness of this conjugation action on VK plus one. Let's see whether this is true. So again, by our formula double star, we have C H naught of um, um, an element V. So then this V is now in VK plus one. So this is delta, uh, sorry, uh, not delta, the left shift with H naught inverse, uh, no, sorry, with H naught, delta of uh, V, and then we have the H naught in here. Right, okay. So we want to see that this one is smooth. All right, so now we see here that we are actually running into a, sm a small problem, right? So because we want to, uh, we want to be going into, uh, we want the smoothness on VK plus one, and this is now in V, K plus one. Um, okay. However, uh, stop here for a moment. Okay. So this is not going to work since um, we don't know yet that the delta is smooth on VK plus one because this is this hinges on the smoothness of the uh, composition, uh, sorry, of the, uh, the conjugation mapping. However, there's one crucial piece of information which we have not exploited yet. And this crucial piece of information is that uh, we, uh, that the situation is actually asymmetric. So we have here the conjugation with H naught. However, we can pick the G naught in a different way. So let's pick the G naught, or let's actually pick an element, not, G, uh, let's make, pick two elements, uh, G naught and uh, G naught, uh, let's say prime, such that if I have G naught times G naught prime, if I invert them, I end up in VK, V to the K minus first. I'm allowed to do this. I mean, no, nobody is, is going to stop me. Uh, and what we get then, I mean, here in the green one, or a new element needs to be set in here. So it's G naught prime and G naught, and then inverse. So now this is in VK minus one. This is in VK. Then I'm getting rid of the plus one here. Okay, and we see that actually, so I mean, uh, the point was, uh, so now I have an element in VK. And our induction assumption was that the conjugation is smooth on VK for all H naught in V. So we have not toyed with the H naught. Uh, right, because the H was in V, the H naught is the same as 
H. So this is actually in V. So we see that this index here is in V. And thus we know that the conjugation here is also, so we don't actually need the smoothness on VK plus one. It's just enough to have smoothness on VK. Right? And otherwise we would run into a problem, but we can cheat by just pulling not back to VK, but to VK, uh, sorry, uh, no, uh, by not pulling back to um, something which lives in VK, yes, and uh, instead we're going to VK minus one. So this gives us, uh, so delta is smooth on vk plus one times v. Um, and now we can uh, use this formula double star. Uh, also ch naught from vk plus one raised in g naught is smooth for all uh, h naught in v. Okay, so in this finishes our inductive proof. Then now we have the smoothness with respect to the second component. And uh, for all the K, uh, or we can also, could also write, so the delta is now smooth as a map from G naught times V with values in V. Yes, and then enough with values in V with values in G naught. And the CH naught is now smooth from G naught with values in G naught for all the H naught in V. Okay, now um, obviously we want not uh, we want to extend smoothness also to the second component. However, let's let's uh, let now um, let's say W be something in V squared. Um, and V be something in G naught. Then we have again our formula star and the star tells us that we have V W can write this as um, lambda multiplied Oh, well, left multiplication with something. Again, this is, it's not important what this is as long as we have a formula here. Um, composed with C H naught. Uh, again, choose H um, naught in V with H uh, naught W or in the inverse of this one multiplied with W should be in V. And then we have Delta and uh, we don't even need to choose a G naught here uh, because we can just take the V. And then we multiply here with uh, H naught inverse times W, right? And um, so whatever, uh, so the second, I mean the Delta, is now applied to something which lives uh, on the Cartesian product of well, uh, G naught, and this comes from V, so it's smooth. Uh, the result of when I apply delta to something in this Cartesian product is again something in G naught. Since the H naught is in V, we know that the um, conjugation action is smooth. So this is smooth, left multiplication was smooth anyway. So this is uh, smooth on G naught times V square. And we can now basically use this formula as a bootstrapping argument, right? So when we know that uh, this one is smooth on VK, uh, on G naught times VK, then looking at the formula shows us uh, that it will also be smooth on G naught times VK plus one. And uh, so this means a trivial induction. Shows that delta is smooth as a mapping from G naught times G naught with values in G naught. Okay, and this 
concludes the first part of this proof. Um, right. So we get actually a Lie group structure. Okay. Mm. Now we wish to prove the second piece. Let's have a look. What was again here the, the statement in the Bobaki theorem? So we now have a Lie group structure on G0, and G0 is an open subset of the manifold uh, G. We want to prove now that under the additional assumption that uh, the conjugation is smooth in some neighborhoods of the identity, we want to see that uh, then G can be made into a Lie group using this uh, manifold structure with the shifted charts we have here. Okay, so the additional assumption we, uh, we can now leverage is that in some generating set G, uh, or for every element in, in a generating set G, there exists a neighborhood of the unit, may, depending, uh, may depend on the uh, element in the generating set such that uh, the conjugation is smooth on this neighborhood. Okay, let's uh, take a look how this goes. Um, right, so uh, it's again by induction. So we show inductively that um, delta is smooth on a neighborhood of uh, G H, where G is just an arbitrary element in G, and H is S1 times S K for S I being elements in the generating set. So this is our notation for the generating set of G. Right, uh, I from one to K and the induction here is over K. Um, okay. Um, right, now by, okay, let's first note that what we get from first part. So Delta uh, is smooth on G naught. Um, wins there is an open uh, G H uh, neighborhood neighborhood which gets mapped. I and delta composed with lambda G inverse, lambda H inverse into this neighborhood WG. Remember WG um, is, um, so this WG is the neighborhood, um, the unit neighborhood, such that the conjugation with respect to G uh, is smooth on uh, right arm. Sorry, um, should have said, of course, uh, now upstairs we have written um, the G here. So the assumption should be that the G comes from the generating set. Okay, now if H is S1, um, all right. So then um, what we have here is um, 
So this is in the generating set. Um, <clears throat> now, so let's, um, so if we have that one, um, well, the mapping star, uh, or this identity star, remember again, so we have delta um, of x and y. This is left shift, and again, as always, I'm, I don't care about the left shift. Um, then we have composed with C, H naught. Whoops, aha. Uh -huh. Yes, and now I see that there was an error concerning here. So the G should again be an arbitrary element, right? So we want the G to be an arbitrary element. And my error here was basically I want to map this into, not into a WG neighborhood, but in an, into a WH neighborhood. So the, we need that the multiplication with CH, or the conjugation with CH is smooth. Okay, now, fair enough. Uh, so we have the H being S1, and the S1 comes from the generating set. And uh, we set again H naught equal to S1. So then we have conjugation by S1. Okay, let's see. And we have the delta here of um, the G. Actually, we don't, uh, ah, sorry, not of the G, of um, lambda G inverse applied to X. And we take here lambda of um, H inverse applied to the Y. Okay, by our assumption, if we are staying in the small GH neighborhood, this thing is contained in WH. So, and, double, and so this is the same as WS1 and by construction H naught was S1. So we see that um, this guy here, is smooth on um, WS1, right, which is great. Left shifts were smooth anyway. This left shift, this left shift, and this left shift smooth. By assumption, uh, the left shifts transport the X and the Y into a neighborhood, into an open neighborhood of uh, the identity. And we may assume that this open neighborhood is contained in G naught because G naught is open. This is an open identity neighborhood. So we know that this is smooth on uh, an open identity neighborhood. Okay, right, and what this shows us that the delta is smooth on um, an open uh, neighborhood of um, the set G times now curly G. Note that this is the generating set. And we don't have any information about openness or whatever about this, but we can, uh, the argument above shows that we can actually get, um, uh, can actually get the smoothness on some open uh, neighborhood of this generating set, which is of course not enough to show it for the whole group. However, um, uh, we can sort of do a little bit better applying this identity double star with the uh, conjugation shows and I ask you to pause now if you uh, want to work it out yourself and see uh, shows that um, C H naught is smooth 
on G for all H naught in the generating set. This again follows just from our observation that on an open neighborhood of G times the generating set, we have smoothness of the delta map, and when we plug this in into uh, the formula double star, we get smoothness of the conjugation. Okay. Um, so what this means um, is, uh, uh, sorry, just to be clear. So the G here is, this is the group G, right? So the conjugation with elements in the, um, in the generating set is now smooth on all of G and not just on the generating set on open neighborhood, right? And um, inductively, and this is really not trivial induction, one then shows that um, if uh, delta is smooth on an open neighborhood of uh, G times, then we take here the union of all the k-fold powers, uh, sorry, because I should say n-fold powers, one smaller than k, uh, one smaller than n smaller than k, okay. then uh, delta is also smooth on an open neighborhood of G times uh, generating set. Oh, yes, I botched again the indices. Uh, so here it's of course the n-fold power of the generating set. Here we also take the n-fold power, but now up to k plus one. All right, and it's again the same argument as before. We look at the we look at the formula star. We now know that um, we can pull back by um, we can pull back by the h uh, by, by taking s one uh, so by taking we have delta of um, x y x y equal to lambda, we don't care about this. Then we have the conjugation action. We take S1, the S1 conjugation action. And here we take delta of uh, X. Well, actually, we have, to, we have to shift this um, with something to be in the right neighborhood of the X. And then we have lambda S1 inverse of the Y. And if we assume that the Y is generated by uh, K plus one elements from the generating set, then this is in uh, the K, uh, the thing which can be uh, generated by K times applying this. We already know that the Delta is smooth on uh, the whole group times um, GK. Uh, we know that the conjugation action is, uh, when we are conjugating with one element with an element in the generating set, then this becomes smooth, and this is sort of the trivial induction proof uh, that smoothness of delta is then also uh, can be bootstrapped from smoothness on the lower uh, products. Okay, upshot is the G is a Lie group. And this concludes our proof. As I said, uniqueness follows basically because we know that a Lie group to, um, a structure is uniquely determined by uh, defining what the manifold structure around the identity should be. Okay, so we are now done with the proof of this Bobaki result. Let me uh, just go back to the result. So uh, the upshot is if we have a, a smooth structure in a group around the identity, uh, some assumptions. We can expand this to a, a smooth global structure. And um, right, so 
what uh, and another useful piece of information which we exploit in the current group construction is um, what this whole argument with Bobaki shows if you have a chart around the identity in your Lie group you can always move it around by say for example left multiplication and generate a family of charts which defines the same manifold structure uh, than before Okay, and uh, this is very useful to know that a uh, chart around the identity for, for a Lie group is basically already giving you an atlas by sort of left shifting everything around and um, looking at the, at the result. Okay, that's it for now.